Welcome to Conversations with Creative Vagabonds, Thinkers, and Innovators. This is the place where great minds come to chat, and I am your host, Sandra Lee Schubert, and welcome to the show. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I am excited to have on a wonderful guest today. His name is Mark Ziegans, and he is going to help us break through our creative blocks and build our audience. He is a creative development advisor who has spent many years helping artists and writers and creative people thrive and shine. He will share with us his insights into breaking through creative blocks, developing focus, and again, building a natural audience. So I I think this will be a really wonderful, informative show for us. And Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sandra. It's great to be here. Very good. Well, we we have a lot of time to talk about stuff. And... um, uh, you know, we we sort of touched base through uh, initially through Gmail, and and you're often, I believe, California at the moment. No, you're, right. you're somewhere. Yeah. You're, you're, you're in, in somewhere very opposite from where I am. That that's 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 that much I I know. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you what a creative development advisor is, and maybe let's start there. Okay, great. Well, and yes, I'm in California. I'm in Santa Cruz, which is a beautiful little town about 70 miles south of San Francisco, uh, right by the water. Um, A creative development advisor is kind of a job that I made for myself. And what I do is work with writers, artists, musicians, actors, filmmakers, directors, anyone in the creative life who's either at a point where they're going through a major transition in their creative career and want to sort through how to make that transition, or where they're starting out perhaps in their creative work, um, or or they have particular challenges or issues that they're facing. You mentioned creative blocks, and that's quite common. People will get stuck at some point in writing their book. They'll get stuck doing... um, paintings for an art show, and they'll want to talk through those issues. But I also work with people who are highly productive but want to do a better job of finding their audience and and saying, who's really going to connect with this work, and how do I meet them, and how do I meet them in a way that feels good, authentic to me? Very good. Now, so you are also a writer and a poet, as you mentioned. Now, I'm assuming part of this process of getting to doing this work or developing this work was experiencing blocks in your own creativity. Um, so is that true? Do you, that that I mean, some artists don't experience creative blocks, and I, I believe that's a wonderful, excellent thing. But is that something that happened for you, and it, did that feed into you developing this work for for other artists? I I did have times where I stalled out, and then I'd find ways through it. So that was definitely one part of it. Um, The other piece of it was that for about a decade, a little less than a decade, I ran a program at Harvard called the Innovations Program. And we sort of looked at best practices in government and really extraordinary innovations. And I found that I was having lots of mid-career students and lots of senior executives in the executive programs coming to me for advice. And oftentimes the advice was, how do I break through to something new? And over the years, I began to find that I liked having that conversation much more than just about anything else I was doing. And so I eventually began to migrate into a practice, first working with people who were innovators and then into the arts. And, and it really grew very organically out of, out of that experience of having people show up at office hours with perplexing questions and asking for help. 
<laughs> I love the per- perplexing questions. What kind of per- perplexing questions did they have? Oh, all kinds of things. A lot of them had to do with with having done something for a good part of their career, and they were now going to go out and do something entirely new. And mm-hmm. how did they find the tools to do that? How did they explain it to their families? How did they begin to get traction when they were starting from scratch? Um, others were moving into positions of extremely significant responsibility. And oftentimes at the top of the agencies they were running or the organizations they were running, and suddenly they were moving from a mode of executing you know, what, what the policies and, and instructions that they were be given by their bosses into framing what's our vision, what's our mission, how do we do this, what's the strategy, and how do I communicate that? And, mm-hmm. and so they wanted to know how do I go about this and do it in a way that really works for me, for the organization? How do I not get hung out to dry? And we began to work through questions like that. Um, and it was, just, it was just absolutely fascinating. Every time I worked with someone, I just found myself lighting up. And eventually I found my way to arts organizations and then working with individual artists. And when, when I got to that point, I knew that I'd really hit my sweet spot, that this was my calling. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. Do maybe explain for people. I mean, we're we're kind of just dealing with blocks at the moment, and and sure. um, and what might a block be for somebody? What I mean, I know some people know about writing blocks or that kind of thing, but what what does that look like, and how might it manifest for different people? Well, one one example is an artist who painter who had painted very successfully in a given style for 20 years and then felt that they wanted to work really in a very different way, um, um, using different tools, different imagery, very, very different style of painting. And it was a very, very risky experience because this person had work in museums, this person had work in major collections, had a major New York gallery, and this was work that didn't fit with what they were known for. And so the question was, how do I go and do this work and how do I share it and present it? And what happens if it fails critically? What happens if it fails to sell? Am I going to be hung out to dry? Is this going to ruin my career? And those questions ended up paralyzing the painter. And so what we did over time was we talked through the issues. We began to think about a way to embrace the work for what it was. We developed a strategy of communicating about it that didn't disown the prior work or abandon it that didn't leave the gallery and reviewers blind as to what this person was doing, but created a context for the work. And when we were able to create a context for the work and lower the emotional stakes associated with doing this material, the painter caught fire and 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 did many more pieces than there was available wall space in the gallery and really got to pick the very best stuff. Um, and the show did did very well. So So that's an example of someone in midlife um, who, who got blocked because of the fear of change to, new, to a new way of working. Right. So when you talk about creating a context for the work, can you explain that a little bit, what that means um, for people? Sure. Well, any time we introduce a new piece of work or a new way of working, if people know us already or think they know us already and we're doing something that's really different rather than variations on familiar themes, we need to give them a story as to why. Well, this really is different somehow. Um, Here's what I was thinking when I came to this. Here's why it appeals to me. This is what attracts me. This is why I wanted to make a break from past work, or here's how it connects to it in a way that might not be obvious just by looking at it or just by reading it. And so when we begin to develop a narrative where we share what we're about with our readers, with our patrons, with our viewers, with our audiences, and invite them into the narrative, they get absolutely fascinated with with how our creative process is unfolding for us, because that's usually left pretty oblique. And that's a way to contextualize something that they're seeing new. 
similarly, if you're starting out in your career, say you're a, a musician and and you're you're a rock musician or you're a rapper or something like that, and you're not known by the world yet, one of the best ways that you can begin to bring your work to the world is to tell your story. Where did this come from? What is this about? Who am I? Why am I addressing these themes? Why do these things matter to me? And when we do that, we give people access to something about us and to something about the work, and it makes it easier for them to engage, and it makes it a, a richer experience. So, so when somebody's have, having a change in terms of their work, and they they're experiencing fear, they're experiencing some sort of anxiety around that. Do you? I, I, well, I, let me just. I know for me, when I've when I've changed writing styles, when I went from poetry to writing essays, or when I, you know, went to articles, or I started doing work for, um, uh, doing copywriting work. These are all sure. kinds of different different types of style, and, and you know, coming up as a poet, poetry, you know, in my mind, it has this very pure, authentic, you know thing and you can't mess with it you know it's it's yeah. it's got this this kind of implied purity to it and then skipping into copywriting it seemed like for me at some point i was selling out mm-hmm. and do you find that that happens with artists that maybe they're tra- maybe they've had a style that's sort of avant-garde, but now they're going into a style that seems a little more traditional. Do artists or writers or whoever you work with find that they start to deal with these kinds of issues in in their work that feels like they're selling out or, and that creates some of those blocks for them? Well, yeah, they, they absolutely do. And I'll tell you a funny story about it. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about when someone's okay. selling out and when they're not. <laughs> so I, I was sitting at a cafe in New York a few years ago um, with, with some friends who were musicians and, and um, a guy who was a composer. And another guy came over who was also a composer and a musician. And he said, I need to talk to you folks about something. And we said, yes, sit down, join us. And we said, what is it? And he said, I want to know whether I've crossed the line to selling out. And we said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, last night I played at Carnegie Hall. And we said, well, that's pretty cool. And he said, yeah, but I was in the backup band for Neil Sedaka. And, and um, you know, he was a hardcore, serious composer. And so the other composer at the table looked at him, and he said, what's your rent? And the guy said, 1500 a month or something like that. And he said, how much did you get paid for the night? And the guy said, $2,500. And he said, well, okay, now you have a month's rent and a month's food. Go write some music. <laughs> that's right. So... So part, I, I guess that that that's always the quandary for for artist and and is the idea of keeping the art pure and and not being paid for it or or you know or or or, or the opposite of that not getting paid by other people. So there's always this kind of push pull to create yeah. art for the the art's sake and not you know, get paid for it or, or wanting to sell your art and, and having people th- think, well, I could do this art, so I'm not going to sell it. So these kinds of questions come into play when creating and I think also sort of feed into this whole issue of people getting really stuck with their creative process. Sure, sure, yeah. And I think it, there are a couple of distinctions that we can make which are helpful. One is if you're talking about the work that really matters to you that you're serious about Mm -hmm. and that you care about, you need to keep that pure on its own terms. Now, its own terms might be if you like writing mystery novels or noir films or something like that, and that's your pure thing, even though it's in a commercial, you know, venue, that's fine. But if you're writing work that's avant-garde, that's experimental, that's written um, at a high level of abstraction, and so it's got a limited audience, but that's really who you are and what you do. You have to do that work well. You can't sell it out. 
And and the question then becomes, how do I go and find the group of people that might actually be interested in engaging with this work? Mm -hmm. And it might be a small group of people, or it might be a very large one. But but you say, once I make this work which is real, I'm not going to twist it to get an audience, but what I will do is I'll go out and look for an audience. And so I think there's a really important distinction here to make between pandering and finding a way to reach out to your audience after you've made something that's truly an authentic expression of you and your art. And I think the latter is fine, but we do, most people just don't know how to do that or even think that they're allowed to do that. They sort of get caught on the hooks of a dilemma. It's either build it and they will come, and I'm praying that they come, but I really don't believe that they will, or I've got to become a product marketer. And, and that feel, the latter feels like selling out, and the former feels futile. And, and so a very important piece of this is saying I'm going to do my best work and I'm not going to sell it out. I'm not going to pervert it. I'm going to do what I need to do, and I'll accept that there is a finite audience for my work, but I'll actually go find it. Right. So it, it's it, it being able to say that uh, you may have a distinct style, and maybe that style may not reach you know 90% of the masses, but somewhere in this world – there are people that appreciate that style and and if you just sort of present it as it is at some point you're going to sort of find that audience as you're saying and i know we're going to talk a little bit about finding your natural audience sure but i i, I guess i know for me and and when i've done copywriting you know you that's a different thing than writing a piece of poetry that you put out and somebody either says oh yeah well we'll publish it, we'll buy it, well, we won't. Sure. But when you're doing copywriting, you are working with a client who is going to ask you to sh change pieces of writing. And and I know some people don't consider, may not consider copywriting or that kind of writing, artistic writing or, or creative writing. But in my mind, I, I, I do, because it, it all has to come from some source and you have to, have an imagination to sort of get some of that out in some way. And it is, it is a challenge in, in that respect to say, okay, how do I maintain my integrity as a writer, but also uh, uh, please the, the person who is hiring me to, to do this writing for sure. them. And, you know, that is, you know, it is a bit of a, a bit of a challenge, but I also, I know for me, you know, my my goal is to sort of get into the client's head. And when I've sure. successfully gotten into the client's head and sort of understand what they want, then I can really create something for them that they may not even have thought of. And so that creative process is there, but part of it is me saying, well, I'm not coming from this purely from, you know, I I, I have to be able to access somebody else's, thoughts and feelings to create this work and make it that, work for them. That's, that's right. It's a, it, when you're doing that kind of work, it's a social creative process. It's not an individual process. And I think that the first step towards someone who goes into a medium that's social or that's commercial is to embrace the medium on the terms in which it operates and to recognize mm -hmm that it's not a general referendum on them as an artist or as a writer. It's mm -hmm. a different kind of work that has its own limits and possibilities. And that within that frame, one can establish what I call conditions of, of consent, which is to say there are some things I will say yes to and there are some things I will say no to. So, for example, with copywriting, it may be that there are some products or some issues or ideas that you simply morally don't want to engage. And so you right. say, I won't do copywriting about these things. Similarly, you may say, I will never be in a position as a copywriter where I will lie to my audience. Right. And Absolutely. for everybody, their conditions of consent are different. But I think for an artist coming into, into a commercial medium or a collaborative medium, to realize that it's not a black and white choice, either I'm a pure artist or I'm a total sellout, 
but that there's variety in creative media. They have their different constraints. But I always have the freedom to say yes and no to what I want to say yes and no to. And that may limit, in some sense, my commercial opportunities. But it may also expand them because I'm very clear and focused about what I do, what I do well, and why. And as you said, when we get into our clients' heads and we understand that and we, and we seek out clients, who meet our conditions of of consent, we're very, very likely to do good work for them and not feel and that, I, that we've sold out. Right, and I, I know for, for me, when I'm, you know, when I've had to work with things that maybe in, inherently may not seem that exciting or, or I don't understand them or I don't necessarily have an interest. Like, you know, I'm not, not necessarily going to get work all the time that's interesting to me across the board, but there are sure. always elements that can be interesting within it. And I, I know when I can play with it and I can look at it and I have an opportunity to be when I'm naturally curious about it, you know, say, okay, this is something I don't know about. If I'm doing something in cars and I don't drive, you know, and I, I could basically not tell one car from the other, you know, so this is an opportunity for me to expand my world and learn something. And when I can come to it from that place, I've added something into my my sort of my toolbox for future use. Even if if it's outside of the realm of copywriting, I've gotten some some information that I actually can use down the road for something else within a poem or within a prose piece or an essay piece, some other creative piece that I might not have before because I've approached it from a point of view of curiosity and learning. And that that really has shifted how I approach that kind of work for me. It's an opportunity that before it might have not seemed that way. I think that's exactly right. And the point that you're making is a very good one, that when we engage projects with curiosity, and when we explore what on the surface may not be that interesting to us with a sense of I'm going to learn something here, I'm going to get material from this that I've got in my back pocket and who knows when I'll bring it out and use it, that becomes a very, very exciting thing. And we really don't know when that work comes out in other ways. I find I've got a new book of poems coming out in September and there are several poems in it where in order to characterize people who are sort of walking the edge of American commercial culture, I reference certain brands. And it very, very quickly sets you in a particular location and in a particular time. And if I didn't know about those brands and and what they meant and what they meant to the people there, I never would have used them in the poems. And I just might have said smoking cigarettes rather than viceroys. And when you say viceroys, it means something very different. Right. And, and you, you learn this, I think, all the time. When we go in honestly and really inquire into what's here, it gives us richness and texture and depth that's available to our art that, that we oftentimes wouldn't have otherwise. And it also makes what we bring to our art very particular because we're now bringing to it things that we've followed on our path, including the path of our day jobs. Right. right. And everything then sort of has an opportunity to feed back into your art in some way or another. I mean, you know, you know, when I used to ride the subway every day, it was a rich, I mean, part of it could be awful to ride the subway, but it was a rich sure. playground for our, opportunity for char- characters, for sights, for se- smells, for conversations. I mean, it was sort of like, you know, who could ask for a better opportunity than to dive into, you know, just a hundred people and hundred characters. I mean, it just, you know, was a wonderful kind of, I always said it was like theater. It was al- always like theater to be in the subway. And these are the opportunities that present themselves on the day-to-day basis for artists and painters and, and whatnot. And, and it's just a matter of being able to look for them and, and take them on in some form or another. That's absolutely right. And, and it also 
really fuels our imagination. I remember one thing that I began to notice on subways. When you take a subway out from the, the downtown core of the city out to an, an, an outer stop at rush hour, you'd mm-hmm. see a couple hundred people on the car, and the costumes they were wearing were extremely varied. And as you'd watch people and watch them get off the stops as you were riding further and further out, I began to realize that everyone who's wearing whatever he or she is wearing, when they get off the train and go into their neighborhood, that's what everybody is wearing. But one stop down the line, they're all wearing something different because it's a different ethnicity, it's a different background, it's a, it's a different economic bracket. And, and the wonderful jumbling and juxtaposition of all of these people who have private lives and, and overlap and similarity in where they live and then all get jumbled up as they come into and go out of the inner city is, is extraordinary. And as a writer, that fuels my imagination. So, so wh- where is this guy who's getting off the subway here living? Who's he living with? What's his social circumstance? What does he do after work? What does this woman do after work? Is she going home to a family? Is she going home alone? Um, and, and it's a wonderful fuel for a writer or a poet to begin to ask those questions as you're riding on an outbound train. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and it is it is a wonderful opportunity, and I, I guess you know when we're talking about breaks and I'm not breaks, I'm sorry, creative blocks and these kinds of issues that artists confront, the opportunity does exist to sort of look at things in a different way, and and some of that, as you mentioned, helps that artist sort of break out of of that slump or that block or whatever may happen because they've taken things in a different direction. Like I know whenever I've gotten a little dry in one area, then I will decide to, you know, try to write something in a genre that I'm not used to. And then that helps that process. So if I'm, you know, if I'm having trouble, you know, doing, you know, copywriting, then I can break into poetry for the copywriting. But, you know, if I can't do my poetry, then I can decide to write song lyrics, which is something I don't normally do. So the it, it helps for me, at least, to sort of take on other um, challenges to sort of fuel the, the, the initial piece of art that I'm wanting to, to work with. And I think that's a really good point both shifting frame, doing something different, and also taking breaks. You know, what we tend to do if we focus on one thing exclusively is we use the same old pathways in our brains again and again and again, and we begin to burn out. If we vary what we do and how we do it and the projects that we're working on and also the stage of development of the projects that we're engaged with, that variation gives gives us a time to rest, and it gives us the occasion to to draw references from from something we're doing very different that might inspire us in in the area where we've been a little more stuck. Right. Now let's talk a little bit. I'm, uh, so we've got we're moving past blocks. We're exploring different opportunities. So um, what do you do with the artist that's having trouble? Focusing because I know that some part of what your work is is helping the artist uh, get get to focus their work. Like I know, you know, I know an artist who just produces amazing quantities of work. Has a full time yeah. job, painting murals, painting other projects. I mean, he's producing enormous, enormous amounts of work. While other artists are still struggling with the same painting or the same piece of writing or. Sure whatever it is, or to get to, you know, whatever, they get distracted. So, and art, I, you know, I mean, I maybe I want to generalize about artists, but, you know, I know sometimes we, artists can be a little scattered because so many things can catch your eye and, you know, pull you off, off your goal. So how do you help artists focus? Okay. So there, there are a couple of things that are important to say to kind of frame that discussion. The first okay. is, um, and, and, and this is sort of referencing Howard Gardner, who's the guy who wrote the books about our seven different intelligences. And, one of, and he studied creativity for a long time. And one of the points that he makes repeatedly is, is that product fluency and fluidity, that is being able to 
get products out very, very rapidly is not necessarily a strong predictor of ultimate creative success. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the case that some people can just produce vast amounts of work because that's the way they're wired and because the projects that they're working on admit themselves to that kind of regular production schedule. Other people can't because they're emotionally and physi- physiologically wired different ways, because the projects are deeper, because they need to struggle through them in order to succeed. So I think the first mm-hmm. important thing to say is, is that is that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not being productive if you're producing at a slower rate. You may have a lower energy level, and that's legitimate, so long as you are progressing, even if it's by fits and starts on the work. And a wonderful sure. example of that is Charles Darwin, who struggled for years and years and years and years to get his um, theory of natural selection out and finally published only because he was facing competition and didn't want to be trumped by someone else. Interesting. It's interesting. So, so, so what you're kind of what you're saying is that well, not all of us, not all of us can be mass producers, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean right, not. Right. You know, some of us have to sort of sit with something for a longer pe- period of time or mull it over. There's some process that's a little different because we are all individual creative beings so how we each approach the the work is different based on just a number of factors you know that aren't the same for everybody so but how would you so how would you identify as an artist where you're saying oh i'm really procrastinating on this how would you identify like just being a slug or or doesn't matter if you're being a slug on it a project and you know would you is there a way to identify when you're just sort of like yeah i just rather eat ice cream than be in art right right now or does it matter sure. in the long run i guess that's why i'm at me this well, you know what? I yeah, it, you know. it, it, <laughs> it does it does matter in the long run and again okay. There's a lot of variety among artists, so one important dimension in which artists vary is where are they in the line of their life and in their creative development. So the question that you're asking would have a very different answer for someone in their late teens into their early 20s than it would for mm-hmm. someone in their mid-30s, for someone in their mid-40s or 50s, and for someone at the end of their career. And, and so we would approach it differently with each kind of person. So let's take a very young artist. Um, what happens a lot with young artists is they tend to be highly prolific, but they then tend not to be disciplined in terms of technique unless they're in a field which trains in technique. And so at a certain point, they have to go through sort of an apprenticeship and journeyman process where they actually master the tools of their art so that they can do things, so they have more expressive capacity and ability. And a lot of them say, this isn't fun anymore. And they stop focusing because art was always expressive and fun and got them attention and and they got the high of just putting something out there and people loving it. And now it becomes a question of developing discipline and technique and variety. And so with someone like that, the question is, do you really, really want to master the discipline or disciplines that you're in so that you have the occasion to do more powerful work more varied work and work that has deeper meaning for yourself and others. Is that something you really want? And if the answer is no, then the thing to do is say, then just relax about it and have fun and remain a gifted amateur, and that's fine. But if they want that mastery, then you begin by having a conversation about the work that it entails and why, and beginning to set expectations differently that not everything is going to be fun and easy, that there will be boredom, that there will be learning technique and service of things that you want to accomplish. That's one kind of a conversation. At the other end of a career, maybe someone realizes that they've got at best 10 years left to produce, and suddenly they've got a finite number of projects that they know they can do. They're in reasonably good health, but they're 75 years old, and they don't know how long that will last. And they also care about the legacy that they want to leave. And so they've been spending the last 40 years as a warrior for their art, putting things out, promoting it, and all of that. And now their concerns and questions have changed. 
and they're scared, and they fear their mortality, and they fear their loss of productivity, and they're terrified by the sense of limits, and they can't focus as a result of that. Then the conversation is about how do we embrace this new phase of life that we're at and begin to think in an authentic and deep way about how we want to work what the few things that we most want to select are and how we invest ourselves in them so that they're resonant for us and that they create a powerful creative legacy. That's a very different kind of conversation. And the conversations that one would have in the middle also vary depending on what the person's struggling with. So it, it, so you, you really, as as with you know the variety of artists, there are, are the variety of ways to deal with who you are in relationship to your art and how yeah. you produce that art. So it's not a, like so you're when you when you personally are working with somebody, maybe you have a set of, of ways to sort of identify something with a person, but each person requires maybe a different type of conversation than the person that you may have talked to an hour before because of who they are with relation to their work and where they are in life. So the questions are very, very different because I mean, I I know artists, you know, I mean, I live in a neighborhood where there are art galleries up and down the block. Some of those art galleries have the art of the people who own them. Some don't. Some of those some of those artists are people who trained and studied in their art, and some people just picked up a camera and a paintbrush and started painting without any training and managed to produce art and sell it. Sure. Very different experiences. Those two people, you know, those artists, you you aren't necessarily going to approach in the same exact way like the artist who just picks up the the pen and pa- pa- paper. You know, he may never study art. And he may still have a career that feeds him and makes him happy, where the other artists may need to study a new camera technique because, you know, they want to do something very different with their photography. So those are very different approaches to two people within the same block radius. So each artist has a unique quality that can be cultivated. And I guess for artists, the thing is to you know, not compare yourself in the same way to another artist, even if you admire them, because how they are mentally, spiritually, whatever, is just not going to be the same for who you are as an artist. Exactly. I think a good question to ask is, is there anything that I can learn from this person that's helpful to me? You know, if you see someone doing something that you like, it's great to be able to study what they're doing or how they're doing it. And and if there's something of value to you, take it. But to make sort of um, self-critical comparisons or invidious comparisons between yourself and another artist is o- only going to lead to distress and, and reduce your productivity as an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, art- artists, and what, this is what I find with people, when we begin to talk about where are you in life, What are you trying to accomplish? What are your needs? What are your resources? How do you want to work? And and how do your expectations relate to who you really are and what's really possible? Once we begin to sort that out, then we can find a very authentic way for that person to work and a very original way that works for this particular individual. Now, certainly there are some commonalities that, you know, having done this for many years, there are certain kind of basic tools that you see work frequently, not always, but frequently. But a lot of it is really, really tailoring choices and strategies to the particular vision and personality and temperament and skill set and energy level of, of the individual artist. And when they realize that they can have things tailored that way and thrive, you hear the biggest size of relief you can possibly imagine. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard things where people will say something like, I didn't even know I had permission to do that. And they yeah. believe that they don't have permission to go forward and be themselves, and just by granting permission, they feel free. Right. And, and, that, and, and, and conversely, then they're able probably to produce more work or, or produce work 
not necessarily more work, but the kind of work that they really want to produce because of that. Exactly, work that's more truthful. And and they generally do produce more work. Again, they may not produce at the level of of a hyperproductive artist. But Mm -hmm. if they're not tortured, if they're less anxious, if they're relaxed, if they know that they're doing work that matters to them, they will tend to produce more on average than they were producing before. But the measure there is is their individual productivity and how that's changing, not how am I producing compared to my rival. Right. It's it's to whatever their true needs are as an artist, and then they're producing accordingly. Well, and I mean that seems it seems just across the board, as you said, it would make you just feel better <laughs> to sort of have that stress off of you of producing in a certain way and in a certain amount and all those kinds of things. You can you could kick back and sort of be a, a better artist, I guess, at the end of the day, or a happier artist, at least, because of that. Sure. Yeah. Or if you're so, unhappy, you're dealing with your unhappiness, but you're not tortured by it. Right. <laughs> it's, you, could still, you could still do your work. Because I know Robert, I've, I've interviewed Robert Fritz, who's a musician, and he, he, he always says there are many disturbed, troubled artists that manage to get up each day and produce art despite being disturbed and troubled you know they they still can can do their their art no matter whatever is going on in their their heads and you know some of us can some of us can but that that possibility still exists for for artists to produce regardless of anything else that's going on in their lives that's exactly right and then in addition to that Oftentimes what they produce will be conditioned by what's going on in their lives that makes it unique and interesting and powerful and important. There are, there are other people out there who may be troubled or disturbed in similar ways who don't have access to their creativity. And when they read a piece by this person or see a play by this person or what it may be, they may feel well met in a fashion that someone who hadn't lived that experience could never meet them. Right. And so – and, and, so, okay. Go oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that, go was ahead. Basic, that was basically my point. Okay. That... <laughs> so let, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, okay, so let, let's say you, as, you're, as an artist and you're in your midlife and yeah. you're, you know, you've produced a body of work and sure. you're still not, you know, you still haven't sort of, you felt you haven't made that connection with an audience that you want to, and you're feeling a little bit frustrated. Now, sure. what happens with that person? Because, you, know, you know, we all get to that spot, and you've talked about it a bit, you know, that process of how do you then go find your audience or, or, I mean, I guess maybe it's different, but I guess because I'm just thinking because I know so many people in midlife artists who, sure. are, who are struggling with that part, that part of like, how do we get to that next step, step where you sort of break through to whatever that is to, to finding that audience because if you're a musician or if you, you know, you create art for uh, people, you want to reach people. So That's right. what you do, what, what do you do with, with people in that situation, with artists in that situation? Well, the first thing that you do is you talk about what are their implicit views of what an audience is. And people oftentimes have implicit views that are governing their understanding. So it has to be this many people. The book has to sell this many. The painting has to be written up in these places. It has to sell at this price point. I have to make this kind of income a year for my art or I'm a failure. There are all kinds of expectations and assumptions that people embody. And all of those expectations have absolutely nothing to do with finding a real audience. Finding a real audience is about asking yourself a very, very simple question. Why did I make this work? What does it mean to me? What am I trying to do with it? Who might have a meaningful encounter with what I've produced here and why? Where do these people live? What do they look like? What do they talk about? Who are their friends? And 
And if I was to meet a stranger and share the work with a stranger, how would I share it in a way that would be meaningful for her or for him? When we start to ask those questions that are connected to meaning and to communication in a way that's authentic, then we begin to develop a very different view of audience and very different strategies for finding it. Um, I remember um, Sam Phillips, who's the guy who owns Sun Records, um, and that's the, the record company that kind of invented rock and roll. They had Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis Presley and Eddie Cochran and Johnny Cash and all these people, little independent record label. One of the things he used to say was, if you were in a car wreck, and you were dying on the side of the road, and someone stopped at the car wreck, what's the song you would sing to that one person? And if you know that, you know what it is you really want to communicate. And so when we think about audience, if we kind of take the Sam Phillips example as a good one and say, what do I really want to say? And how can I make that matter? And then how can I bring this out to people using what energy I have and resources I have? And people's energy and resources vary enormously. So that some people who might actually be moved by this or might want to own this piece of work or might want to engage it and share it with their friends, how do I go meet them? And how do I share this with them in an authentic way? And when you start asking that question, rather than setting threshold questions such as, and I see this a lot with musicians, if I don't have a hit record, and their what definition of a hit record varies, but let's say if I don't have a gold record on this next album, I'm quitting music. When you start asking threshold questions like that, you're not really looking at who can I communicate with. When you say, who would this song matter to? How might it change her life? And then you go find that person and you sing that song to her. And then you find another person and sing it to him. And then some more people come along because they're connected to it. And you're willing to accept that your audience might be very small or it might grow organically into something larger. That's when you begin to break through. And the breakthrough is on the dimension of connection, not on the dimension of scale. Right. If there's scale to be had, then there are technical marketing questions about how do I promote, how do I break through and reach as many people out there as might be interested in this. Um, but you want to pursue those marketing questions via the lens of how do I achieve authentic connection. Right. So, so if you have the artist that wants to, you know, that has felt that they need to, you know, play in X number of clubs a year or, or their record should sell this many in a year um, and, and they're not getting that it's framing that a little differently so it's not like I, I haven't met X, the, I haven't met my expectations of the number of people but I've met my expectations of the number of connections is that what or, you're saying the, or, like or Okay. It's to let go of the idea of having an expectation and to put the emphasis okay. on authentically reaching out. It's sort of like Zen archery, you know, where you close mm -hmm. your eyes, but you're perfectly focused and aim for the target. You know, Tony Bennett talks about this. Um, if you see the film The Zen of Bennett, you can see him talking about it there. And the mm -hmm. question was, how do you keep singing these same songs that you've been singing for 60 years? And his answer is, because every time I sing the song, I put everything that I have into authentically communicating what I can bring to that song today to the audience that I'm facing. And whether that's one person or 10 people or 20,000 people, it's about making the decision to authentically communicate in that fashion. When I, when I used to do performance poetry and I'd perform in bars and things like that, one of, one of the things that I would do is I would say to myself, can I communicate with such clarity and force that I get the guys who are playing pool in the back to put down their cues and wander over and listen? Can I get the bartender to turn off the game at the bar because people at the bar want to listen? And they'd rather listen to what I'm doing than listen to the game, even though they came in for a beer and, and, and to watch their favorite team play. Can I grab people like that? And if I can do that in the room, then I'm meeting my audience well. But it's not about an expectation. It's about a desire to communicate with everything that I have to whoever is there and trusting that that communication has meaning intrinsically. Now, if I so can bring that you, meaning... Go ahead. 
no, so I'm, I'm just saying, so when you approach your your art with an expectation that if I reach X number of people, then I, I'm successful, that, that creates a, a certain level of pain. But if you reframe that and say that whoever I connect, whoever I'm singing to or, 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 what, or performing to has been moved or changed or shifted, uh, that, 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 reduces that pain in in some way because it's not about the numbers necessarily it's a, it's about that one connection so it could be just that one connection in the room and that could be a success rather than saying you sold out to to 600 people in 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 a, another room exactly and and when you begin to think that way then you begin to ask very practical questions about for example where should i be performing where should i be reading what gallery should i be showing in so if you're a musician where are you going to find your people is it going to be in in rock and roll clubs is it going to be in small theaters is it going to be in house concerts is it going to be in coffee houses and when you begin to think about who, do, who am I really speaking to, who do I have something to say to, how old are they, where are they situated, are they in cities, are they in the country, are they in suburbs, are they in a particular region, are they from a particular walk of life, when you begin to ask those questions honestly, it's amazing how quickly artists get inventive about where and how to share their work and how much more fun they have with it. And that's when they start discovering, hey, there are actually a pretty good number of people out there who care about me and what I'm doing. Right. So, you know, getting back to sort of the, the, the beginning of this conversation, we talked about the person who plays the backup band for Neil Sedaka. So you've got the artist who, you know, you've got to pay your rent, you've got to do, you know, you've got to feed your kids, you've got to feed yourself, you've got to, you know, do all those kinds of practical day-to-day living things. So some part of that may be that you have the nine to five job that sort of, but that feeds you and supports you, and but also supports your art. So so it's not about selling out and having to do a nine to five job. It's about doing something that actually supports the work that you want to do in the world. So so the work you want to do in the world may may only be the three hours or four hours a night or whatever that is. But that that four hours is an excellent, rich four hours, and it's being fed by something that you might have to do nine to five or two hours with the backup band for Neil Sedaka. But it gets you, gives you the opportunity to then really give your time to this other work that really feeds you. That's right. And, and, you know, as you said, it could be the, you know, two hours you're playing in a backup band or it could be a full-time job or a part-time job or it could be a business that you start that you can run part-time. I'll give you a good example. I um, worked some years ago with a musician who was releasing albums and touring but needed work outside of the touring to pay bills. And so what he did was he created a home office organizer business. And what was great about that was it allowed him to play and record while he was in the city. And it was a business he could suspend whenever he was on tour. And the business made him enough money that he easily covered all of his expenses um, um, for the year working, I think, about 15 hours a week. And that covered all of his nut. So so there are all kinds of ways that people can, can come to this. The other question that you begin to ask is, how much time do I really want and need for my art? And what does that imply about what standard of living I'm willing to have and where I'm willing to locate? If you want more time for your art, more freedom for your art, you may choose to locate in places that are much, much cheaper to live, or you may choose to lead a very, very, very simple life in order to buy the time to do what it is you want to do. Um, And again, letting go of expectations and honestly confronting Am I someone who needs to live in a city? Am I someone who needs to have this, that, and the other thing going on? Or am I not? It's going to allow you to make choices that are appropriate. So for some people, they're willing to live very simply on very little, do their work and find their audience, and they don't need to be near the center of anything. Other people, if they're not in the center of things and they're not going out every night and they're not eating at restaurants with their friends and the rest, can't thrive. And those people obviously will need to earn a lot more money. 
and and that factors into their strategy and calculation. So a lot of this is about having very, very honest conversations with yourself about what really matters to me, what do I really need, and what most supports my art, and what most supports my ability to connect with others. Right. So it's making those kind of those kind of choices. Like if you want to go out and buy designer shoes, you may have to then say, I get, you know, three less lattes a week to do that. It's it's sort of that where where what are the choices I need to make that support yeah. what it is that you want to do. So it's like I like to live alone. That's that requires a different set of choices about how much money I'm going to earn because right. I, I I need quiet private time. That's my thing. But other people can live with seven other people and create their art in their room and be perfectly happy and content. But you have to come to those choices on your own. Exactly. You have to come to them honestly. Um, and and then a, a, another thing is that oftentimes people sort of, again, they set up all or nothing stakes. So I either have to have this now or it all doesn't work. And oftentimes when you look at people making transitions, let's say that they really know that they want to live alone and they want their own studio space. It may be that in order to have that, they have to meet certain economic criteria, which they can't meet now. Well, typically, if we sit down and figure out an 18-month to two-year transition plan, we can help people get there. And, and once you understand that I may not be able to have everything I want now, but that I can make a transition and that I can be fairly deliberate, deliberate about what I'm doing to get there, the stress goes down, people's creativity goes up, and they begin finding all kinds of cool things to do that, that because of their anxiety, they weren't even exploring. And so one of the, the really powerful tools that I've discovered in doing this work is helping people to think through what are the things I can really change now and what are the kinds of things that may require a transition over a period of a couple of years, and then how do I manage that transition in a way that's healthy for me? Very good. That, that, that's, those are excellent questions for, for, for people to have to dive into. So we have just about um, two and a half minutes left already. Um, so why don't you just give us a final closing comment and then tell people where they can find you and, and, your, and about your new book. Oh, fantastic. So my closing comment is that the best thing you can do for yourself as an artist is to truly own who you are and love who you are. If you do that, you'll make good decisions. Um, in terms of where people can find me, my website is mycreativedevelopment.com, and you can email me there. My new book is a book of poetry. It's called The Underwater Typewriter. It's on Pelicanesis Press. It's being released on September 25th, but you can pre-order it from Pelicanesis Press now. You can also find us on Facebook. There's an underwater typewriter page on Facebook. Check it out mm -hmm. and like it. And I've also got a short ebook on Amazon um, um, called Finding Natural Audience. And it's a very simple guide to help artists, especially those who are in mid-career and creative professionals who are in mid-career, begin to pick through the question of how do I find my audience? How do I really make authentic connection with the people who will support me in my work? And if you type in my name, Mark Zegans, M-A-R-C-Z-E-G-A-N-S, um, on Amazon.com, you'll find the book very easily. Um, so thank you, Sandra. This has been incredibly fun, and I can't believe how quickly the hour went by. I know. It, it goes – it does – um, I do think, you know, we, we really did cover a lot of things for people, and I do appreciate the time that you've taken with us today. So, again, everybody, this is Mark Zegans, and you can find him at mycreativedevelopment.com, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Sandra, and, and thank you to everybody out there who's listening, and I wish you very, very well with your artistic lives. Great. Thank you. there. I hope you enjoyed the show. It is really great 
fun to speak to people and find out what they're doing in the world. If you are interested in reaching out on air, online, or in person, let me show you how. I am partnered with some great people, some strategic thinkers and consultants to bring you the best services available. Call me at 347 560 1624 or email me at sandraleeshubert at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you.